Senator Simons. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Merci, Madame la Présidente. I rise today to speak to Bill, C Bill S-208, an amendment to amend the criminal code independence of the judiciary. The independence of the judiciary is one of the foundational principles of the Canadian justice system. In criminal cases in particular, we rely on judges to hear all the evidence, weigh all the merits of a case, and then pass a fit sentence, one that takes into account the complicated individual circumstances of each defendant and each crime. I sat through many trials in my 30 years as a journalist, and if I learned anything, it was that no two cases were alike. The charges might be the same, but one murder case was not like another. One child pornography case was not like another. Each trial told its own unique story, and each cast of characters was different from the next. Yet over my 30 years as a reporter and columnist, this country moved more and more towards a model of mandatory minimum sentences in criminal trials, and both Liberal and Conservative governments have added more and more statutory mandatory minimum sentences to the criminal code. Je comprends très bien les raisons politiques pour ces mesures. De nombreux citoyens ne sont pas à l'aise avec l'idée d'accorder un pouvoir discrétionnaire aux juges. Ils n'aiment pas que les juges puissent déterminer la durée de la peine qu'ils s'imposeront à certains contrevenants. Il est plus facile de croire qu'un meurtre est un meurtre. Un point, c'est tout et que la peine universelle permette aux tribunaux de l'utiliser de façon plus judicieuse le temps dont ils déposent et qu'elles ont aussi un meilleur moyen de discussion. Je sais que nombreuses personnes n'en quittent du fait que le juge a, ou à tout le moins certains d'entre eux sont trop laxistes, trop cléments. C'est pour cette raison qu'elle croit que la peine minimale obligatoire protège le système judiciaire et le reste de la population contre les juges qui pourraient être trop cléments envers un criminal généreux. But mandatory minimums are a blunt and crude tool to deal with such problems. They remind me of the story from Greek myth about Procrustus, the son of Poseidon. Procrustus used to waylay travelers and invite them to spend the night at his place. There, he would offer them a bed. But Procrustus's little Airbnb wasn't a terribly comfortable one. He insisted that all his guests had to fit his bed exactly. If they were too short, well then, Procrustus would stretch them to fit. And if they were too tall, no worries, Procrustus would just chop their legs off until they were the right length. It's not a jolly story but I think it's one we should keep in mind as we consider the dangers of applying a Procrustean bed model to the criminal justice system. Mandatory minimum sentences create two real and opposite problems. In the first case, they may require a judge to impose a harsher sentence than is warranted by all the individual complicated facts surrounding a very particular crime. On the other hand, mandatory minimums can actually have a reverse effect. They can contort the justice system. In some cases, juries simply won't convict someone of the appropriate charge because they don't believe the matching mandatory minimum sentence is fair or appropriate. In other cases, Crown prosecutors end up striking plea agreements that are legally illogical because they know in their heart of hearts that the mandatory minimum sentence isn't just. Since I'm a storyteller by trade and by temperament, let me tell you two stories that illustrate my two points. Let me tell you first about Jamie Pasika. On February 28, 2014, Jamie Pasika arrived at the Loblaw warehouse in Edmonton where he worked, armed with knives he'd gone out and purchased at West Edmonton Mall. When he got to work, he went on what I can only describe as a deadly rampage. He ran through the warehouse, stabbing and slashing his workmates. He badly injured four of his colleagues. They survived, but two others, Terno Ba and Fitzroy Harris, were not so lucky. The stab wounds they received were fatal. Basika was convicted on two counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. Now, with the facts I've given you, that may sound like a fair and appropriate sentence. But as I've said, each murder trial tells its own story. It turned out that Basika was a diagnosed schizophrenic with a well-documented history of mental illness. But he'd found it impossible to get effective treatment. He told people later that he'd committed his murders in order to get help for his disease. 
Now, some Canadians might well wonder, given Pasika's psychiatric history, why his lawyers didn't try to have him declared not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder. But Canada's laws are narrow and clear. You can only be found not criminally responsible, or NCR, if you are incapable of appreciating the nature and quality of your actions or from knowing right from wrong. And Pasika didn't meet that test. At the time of his stabbing spree, he was not floridly psychotic. He wasn't hallucinating or hearing voices. He didn't think his victims were monsters or devils. His thinking was even what you could call organized. He planned out his crime in advance, making a special trip to the mall to purchase his knives. Was his capacity to commit his crimes diminished by his mental illness? I think it clearly was. This was not the crime of a rational man. But in Canada, we don't have a diminished capacity defense. Pasika's lawyer argued strenuously that his client should not be convicted of first-degree murder. He tried to convince the court that manslaughter was the more appropriate conviction, or at least offered the more appropriate sentence. But that didn't work. And so Jamie Pasika, who suffered from serious mental illness, went to jail for first-degree murder, because instead of hospitalizing him or giving him outpatient care for his schizophrenia before he acted, we waited until he killed two innocent people and then imposed the mandatory minimum sentence and locked him up for life. That's not fair. That's not justice. But the court had no discretion to craft a more rational sentence. Now, let me tell you the story of Anna Semenovich. On April 15, 2008, Anna Semenovich shot her husband Alex through the head. That fact was never in dispute. Mrs. Semenovich, who was then in her 70s, was originally charged with first-degree murder. And certainly, there was damning evidence of premeditation. She had purchased a large incinerator not beforehand. The man who sold it to her testified at trial that Mrs. Semenovich told him she needed it for her husband's body. The night of the killing, she went outside and shot her sleeping husband through the window of their farmhouse. A victim of years of domestic abuse, Mrs. Semenovich had lived with a violent and mentally ill husband who, according to trial testimony, chased her with a knife, attacked her with a baseball bat, and threatened to kill her on a regular basis. Her grandson testified that he had reported the abuse and his grandfather's deteriorating mental health on a number of occasions to the local RCMP. On the witness stand, he said the police told him that they couldn't help unless Mrs. Mrs. Semenovich filed a formal complaint, something he said his grandmother was too afraid to do. So he gave her a gun to defend herself and taught her how to use it, and eventually she did. Then, with the help of family members, she put her husband's body in the incinerator and turned it on. This, however, was not a cold-blooded murder planned by criminal masterminds, because when the incinerator malfunctioned, the family called a repairman to make a service call. Picture, if you will, and I often have, the sight that greeted the poor incinerator repairman who drove out to the Semenovich property west of Edmonton, opened the incinerator door, only to find Alex Semenovich's not quite incinerated body. It sounds like a scene to rival Edgar Allan Poe. As I mentioned earlier, the widow was originally charged with first-degree murder because, after all, this was clearly a premeditated act, even if it wasn't a very well-premeditated act. But then the Crown faced a dilemma. The mandatory minimum sentence, if they convicted Anna Semenovich of first-degree murder, as seemed inevitable. The mandatory minimum sentence, life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years, would be a death sentence for the elderly defendant. Yet, if the case went to its conclusion, the judge would have no discretion to take into consideration Anna's age or health or the lifetime that abuse she had suffered in his sentence. And so the Crown, the judge, and the defense came up with a pretty creative plea bargain. They allowed Anna Semenovich to plead guilty to manslaughter and accept a custodial sentence of four years. And even that was the mandatory minimum for manslaughter involving a firearm. Did Anna Semenovich commit manslaughter? Well, she didn't shoot her husband in self-defense or in a moment of sudden high emotion. She carefully planned out his killing, right down to the purchase of the telltale incinerator. But everyone involved realized that the mandatory minimum sentence for murder was inappropriate in this case. The only reasonable, the only just solution was a plea agreement predicated on a rather creative distortion of the facts. Those are just two of the cases that I covered in my three decades as a journalist, which demonstrated to me the problems with mandatory minimum sentences. One size fits all justice doesn't just undermine the essential independence of our courts and our judges, it often leads to manifestly unjust outcomes. What we should hope for in our Canadian democracy is that we appoint qualified, well-trained, thoughtful judges 
whom we can trust to apply their legal skills, their personal morality, and their common sense, whom we can trust to analyze both the facts of a specific case and the text of the criminal code, and pass a sentence that is just. If we don't trust our judges to understand the law or to interpret the facts, well, then we have a far deeper and more profound problem that can't be solved with more and more mandatory rubrics. We can't deal with that mistrust, though, by undermining public confidence in the Canadian judiciary, by hobbling our judges before a trial even begins. Bill S-208 doesn't eliminate mandatory minimum sentences, but it does return to judges the right to exercise judgment in very specific circumstances. This is an extraordinarily serious issue, and yet, as we confront it, I confess I cannot stop thinking about Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera, The Mikado. You may remember The Mikado's big number, where he sings, and I shan't sing for you, my object all sublime I shall achieve in time to let the punishment fit the crime, the punishment fit the crime. As the audience for the operetta, we are supposed to laugh at the Mikado's song. But in truth, if we can't trust our judges to let the punishment fit the crime, it is we who make a laughing stock of the entire concept of an independent judiciary. It should not be the job of a government to predetermine and pronounce a sentence before the facts are even admitted into evidence. Instead, let's restore public faith in our judges and let our jurists get on with the job that we've entrusted them to do. Thank you very much.